Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome here to Blake's Barn uh, for this pillow talk on curatorial voices. My name is Brian Schaefer. I'm a scholar in residence here at Jacob's Pillow, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all and to welcome our guests, our curators for the 2021 season. Um, so thank you for being here. And um, as we just learned, uh, kind of very special factoid is that this is the first time that the three curators have been in the same room together since the pandemic. So the entire season was put together remotely uh, via conversations on Zoom and, and whatnot. And I'm sure we'll kind of get into how that worked today, but it's a really special thing to have you all three in person with us today. So thank you for, for being here. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start by introducing our curators. Um, these are going to be um, highly edited biographies because each of them um, have accomplished a lot. Um, I'm going to start to my right where I have uh, Ali Rosa Salas, who is a curator of live performance, music, and visual art. Uh, her approach is rooted in the belief that curatorial practice must serve the public good. And this is part of your bio, and that's something that I'm sure we will discuss today. Um, okay, cool. the, the philosophy, <laughs> yes. Uh, she finds inspiration from cultural ecosystems of New York City, where she was born and raised. Ali is currently the director of programming at Abrams Art Center, Henry Street Settlement, where she curates the center's performance and exhibition programming, as well as supports the center's residency programs. Prior to Abrams, Rosa Salas produced performances, exhibitions, and events as an independent curator at the Barnard Center of Research, Dance Space Project, the American Realness Festival, and the Whitney Museum, among others. Uh, and then uh, to her right is Melanie George, who is an educator, dramaturg, choreographer, scholar, and certified movement analyst. She's the founder of Jazz Is Dance Project and a scholar in residence here at Jacobs Pillow, so one of my colleagues. As a dramaturg, she has contributed to projects by Raja Feather Kelly, Susan Marshall, Urban Bush Women, and many, many more. That's a highly abbreviated list. Um, she is a highly sought after teacher and choreographer of the neo jazz aesthetic, and her jazz choreography is regularly commissioned by colleges throughout the United States. Melanie has worked as an arts consultant for over a decade, assisting artists and organizations in articulating language and facilitating the development of creative work. She is the former program, uh, dance program director at American University and is currently a visiting professor at Cornish College of the Arts. And to her right is Pamela Tachi, who is the executive and artistic director of Jacob's Pillow, responsible for the artistic vision and strategic goals for all aspects of the organization, including festival programming, education, preservation, audience engagement, residency programming, artistic support, and that too is an abbreviated list. Uh, for nearly 17 years prior to this, Pamela okay. served as the director for the, of the Center for the Arts at Wesleyan University in Middleton, Connecticut, overseeing robust programming and acclaimed artistic initiatives for dance, music, theater, and the visual arts, launching many initiatives during her tenure, including the Institute for Curatorial Practice and Performance, the first masters in performance curation. So maybe that's something that we'll talk about today as well, is what that looks like in, in higher education. So thank you all for being here and for being in conversation with us today about um, Festival 2021 and how this came into being, but also how uh, dance will play a role, does play a role and will play a role um, in our society and, uh, and the role of curation in that um, and how it, uh, how we've seen it in the past and how we'd like to see it in the future. But first I want to start by defining curation. Um, I think for those of us who work for arts institutions, it's something that we kind of automatically know what it means, but I think for audiences, it can be a bit opaque what this idea of curation is. So, um, so I'd like to, to hear from each of you your definition of curation um, and maybe how that's evolved for you um, throughout your career and maybe specifically in the past year. Uh, Ali, you want to start? Sure. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that question. I was thinking about that this morning, and I think my definition of, of what curation means will hopefully always evolve. Um, I think when I first began this kind of work, I didn't even know that there was a name for it. I think that there's so many components of what that responsibility holds. I think it's a you're an advocate, you're um, a connector uh, to resources, you are a um, therapist, you are a um, facilitator, you are um, a you know, 
producer of knowledge. Um, and I, I think for me, you know, all of those components kind of come together in the idea that I think my sort of interpretation of curation is really like an exploration of subjectivity. Um, and I feel really, really interested in how curation is connected to authorship and storytelling. Um, and in that, I think it's, it's a very syncretic, very interdisciplinary kind of practice that demands much of a person, depending on the day. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my poetic-ish answer to that question. Thank you. Melanie? Um, I mean, can I duplicate what <laughs> I, uh, I think part of um, why it's challenging to kind of define it is because I think depending on the institution you work for, depending on the kind of work that uh, you may be programming, depending on what your own artistic background is, depending on what your interests are, it, the, the job can be dramatically different, right? And um, I, I'm, I'm going to guess, I don't want to speak for you, but yeah. I'm going to guess like what you do at Abrams and what you do here are not the, are not the same. Like they're, yeah, you know, they, they function differently, right? Yeah. And so um, I, I guess um, more so than, than saying like, this is how I define it, because I don't feel that it's that um, fixed. Uh, I would say more so that I'd rather address that I think for me, curation is an opportunity to imagine and to figure out how to take imagination into something that is tangible. Um, and again, that can take shape in a lot of different ways. I don't think I engage with any of the artists that I've been uh, charged with being the connector between the pillow and, and, and them. I don't think I've engaged with any of them in the same way because they all need different things mm -hmm. and they're all at different stages in their careers and they have different interests and some of them have different histories to this institution. So um, I feel like I'm being really uh, abstract right now but and that's not, uh, I'm not intending to not answer the question but it's also like I feel like in some ways for me, um, I want to stay in that place of abstraction because I don't actually want it to become fixed. I want it, all, I want it to always be malleable. I want it to always be um, mutable, to always be uh, uh, able to shift uh, as the job demands require of it. Mm. All right, thank you. So um, I, I, I think it's amazing that I'm sitting here right now talking about curation because for me, it's something that I've thought a lot about because I worked with Sam Miller, who's a former uh, director here at Jacobs Pillow, to co-found this Institute for Curatorial Practice and Performance. And the very first exercise we did was, as a group, talk about what is what does it mean to curate. And we really began with this idea of the word uh, curation. To curate comes from the Latin root, uh, curare, to care for. And we talked a lot about caring for artists being being a primary foundation of our role. But as I was thinking about, and then what we did was fill up a blackboard with adjectives, and it was therapist connector, you know, all of the things that you've said. And I think it's the most robust vision of curation that, that I feel, because I think it has to change depending on the artist, depending on the moment in time. And so it's, um, it is to care for artists when the, within the context of uh, a community, within the context of a site. And, um, and I think it's a constantly evolving uh, definition. And what I found interesting and why we felt like we had to forge a place to talk about performance curation is, you know, everyone talks about curating in the visual arts, but no one ever talks about curating in the performing arts. And so why not? What, what is distinctive about it? And what we wanted for artists is what visual art artists have is that advocate. You know of a curator, of a, a visual artist, and that person is that person's advocate for life. And so we knew that performing artists needed that kind of advocacy, so advocate is a word that Ellie used, and that's, that's a big one for me. Great, thank you. And so I was wondering now um, if you could talk about kind of how the three of you came together for, for Festival 2021. This is the first time that Jacob's Pillow has had associate curators and a, and a team of caretakers for the season. Um, so can you talk about how that came about and why, why that felt important for you? Yeah. So um, I uh, originally um, thought that it was time to have a guest curator at Jacob's Pillow and I wrote a job description for a single person and I basically let it uh, be known uh, uh, among uh, colleagues that I was looking for a partner in this work. 
Um, I wanted there to be um, another voice in decision making. Uh, we talk a lot about gatekeeping as it relates to equity, diversity, <coughs> inclusion, and access. And for me, it was the time to, to really think deeply about that. And then, uh, and we had a, a number of finalists, and then the pandemic hit. We had a, a hiring freeze, obviously, um, and so that, that search was suspended. And then the more I thought about it, the more I knew this was still a time that we had to find a way to bring in uh, voices, and I didn't want a single voice. I really felt that that was gonna be too much pressure on a single person to come into Jacob's Pillow and be that, that other voice. So the idea of a team really excited me. I, um, working at Wesleyan, I worked collaborative, collaboratively with faculty. I love collaboration. And I sort of, um, I am creative in dialogic circumstances. So I got very excited about the notion of two associate curators. And, um, and then, uh, really, uh, I knew of Ali's work. Ali is one of the first master's recipients from the Institute for Curatorial Practice and Performance. Sure. And, uh, and so for me, you know, I, I've been excited about her work for a really long time. And Melanie George was right here, uh, just doing extraordinary <laughs> just work. Out. Just hanging out. <laughs> but really extraordinary work as a, a scholar. And when you think of both of their backgrounds, they bring a whole pool of artists worldviews with them that are different than mine. And I got excited about working with this team. So we started work in August. Yes. And uh, yeah. What, what's interesting about that, what you just said, Pam, is like now knowing what the workload is, I don't know how any, how you were doing this by yourself. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm not, I'm not even trying to make a joke. Like, like truly, I don't know where the time can be found to do the volume of work that's involved in attending to curation for an institution of this size. It's, it's really, um, it's a lot. It is. And, uh, and um, it seems wise to me, aside from not, not at all trying to diminish um, the really important uh, social justice work that's happening within the institution, but aside from that, I feel like you, you absolutely needed a team. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's know. true. And I want to credit someone who is not here right now, and that's Ariana yes. Massery, who's yeah, our right. producing director, who uh, you know, was, has been my partner in this work, very much so. And then when Allie and Melanie joined, we were a foursome. And then Ariana went and um, had, a, had a little girl. And uh, she, we have our interim producing director, Katie Dammers, who's a terrific curator in and of her Oh, in her own right, so she joined us. So um, I think it's important to credit that, but you're, you're right, it is, it is one, and full season, it's 50 companies who come to Jacob's Pillow. There are 30 on the inside out, and, and you know, and the Sean and formerly, you know, the Duke, another, you know, 20 companies between those spaces. So it is a, a tall order. And so kind of expanding on that, so you mentioned that you all first kind of started the conversations in August and, and kind of knowing what the, the extraordinary workload is, can you take us into what the timeline looked like and, and how, how the conversations started, how they evolved, and then you know, how you break down the work and then how that continued and, and brought us to, to this summer when the festival is underway? Well, I think it's important to note that um, prior to that August date that we're marking as the start of this team, the Pillow had been doing stuff online consistently throughout the summer, and I think that very much informed how we went into planning for what would follow. Um, and one of the biggest things was how do we get people work? How do we put people to work? How do we get people back to doing what they're doing? And so I, I think there was an assessment of, you know, who do we have commitments from, from 2020 mm -hmm. and how do we go about fulfilling those? And then how does this play into the, the, the various things that we as curators have to plan? And so um, I think it's important to note that while we're here talking about the festival, as a curatorial team, we're also curating the, the Pillow Labs and we're also curating the virtual commissions and, and there's dialogues around things that even we don't actually right. have decision making on That's right. regularly. Yeah. That so, I want to bring to them for their input, yeah. Right. So like yeah. there's this, um, uh, it's, it's much, what's the word I'm looking for? It's much more Layered. Layered and right. pervasive yeah. than yeah. it might seem as opposed to like a, sort of like the neatness of what a fest, what the festival is. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, part of this process has been learning each other and learning what it means to work as a team and uh, figuring out what interests are and what communication styles mm -hmm. are. I, I mean, to, I, we can't emphasize enough, 
Ali and I have never actually met before today. Like we've only ever we've only ever been on Zoom together, you know. Right. And we did, wow. and we once did like a, a a private Zoom like cocktail hour, like get to know you thing, right. you know. Yeah. But like there, so like the things that she's taller than I thought she was, you know. <laughs> And, and those may seem like small things, but the way that, you know, as people who work in dance, the way that we intuit things through our physicality and having that be taken away. Totally. This um, is an embodied practice. Exactly. And we have right? never been in the same room. And Zoom couldn't be any less embodied, right? right. So, um, so the learning curve to me, I'm highlighting because it's such an important part of the narrative of the work that's happened over the past year. Totally. And, I, and I do feel like um, there's been some um, collective grace with each other to figure out how to work together. Yeah, I mean, I think the context of living and surviving like a global pandemic, I think that the psychological toll that this time has taken on all of us and how that's impacted our curation, like the strategy for curation for this festival, how we've had to remain adaptable, how that's also impacted who we, can, who we could invite. I mean, on a very logistical level, logistics and I think limitations also are opportunities to be creative. So I think that that, you know, we can't talk about this festival without talking about the real sort of complications of that. And um, I think just to add to your point, the extension of grace in that process, not only with each other, but with the, you know, artists we're working with and just sort of navigating a historically challenging time that I think also, of course, impacts just in terms of values for a festival and how people come together in space after being not together for 16, 18 months. I think that was something that, of course, you know, we took extremely seriously. Yeah. So, so yeah, I can't underscore the impact of this time um, and the preciousness of movement and doing even this. I, I think um, in the planning, I feel really grateful to be able to actually experience live <laughs> and in person. And I, I just want to add two things. One, you know, we did feel a great responsibility to the artists who had been engaged for the Pillow Lab that we had to cancel because of the pandemic. So the first task for us was to plan the Pillow Lab residencies beginning in October. The very first was Brian Brooks. He'll be here next week. Um, and, and so there were a number of artists that, were, that we had to honor the commitments, as Melanie said. And, um, and then in planning the festival, I just want to say there was a really important moment where mm -hmm. Melanie just turned to us and said, you know, this isn't going to be less than. It's just going to be different. We're going to make something that is for this moment and this time. And as much as we were thinking about complications, and let's face it, we had a roster of artists we were going to bring to the Doris Duke Theater for the summer of 2020. We we're going to have socially distant seating, 50 people. We're going to broadcast everything we made there. And that, that ended. In a, in, a, in a heartbeat. And so we had to shift, you know, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to bring artists and audiences back to work? And it was, it is, it, I'm really glad that Ali brought in the emotional, uh, the stakes were very high for all of us to, to well, I just want to acknowledge that, that um, it, I'm so grateful that they were so high for both of you. You know, you invested yourselves to, to make it so that we could, could create what we did. So really, really something. A lot of <laughs> ups and downs and a lot of starts and stops. And that's just what the nature of it was. And, um, and so kind of going off the idea that you were discussing as a strategy or, or a focus for the festival, um, the, there was a, a statement when, you, when Festival 2021 was announced in terms of what the curatorial focus would be. I think it might be helpful to, to read so that um, you all kind of understand what, what some of the ideas were going into this festival. Uh, for the first time, uh, we've opened up the curatorial process. Uh, Pam Atachi uh, planned Festival 21 in collaboration with associate curators Melanie George and Ali Rosa Salas. The team made the decision to delve into the multiple histories that exist on the land where Jacob's Pillow is located. The legacy of Pillow founder Ted Sean will continue to be contextualized. Our history as a site along the Underground Railroad and our responsibility to amplify the role of black artists have had in the evolution of dance is also being honored. Simultaneously, the art of indigenous peoples on whose land we dance, the Agawam, Mohican, Nip uh, Nipmuc, and Pocomtuck, will also be celebrated. And 60% of the artists and companies being presented this summer are BIPOC, um, which is uh, black indigenous people of color. 
Um, so I was wondering if you could share with us how you came to that focus, that uh, statement, um, and what that looks like, putting that into practice. Sure, I think, I mean, I think that you, it was always the time to, to do this kind of work, to really um, be explicit and intentional about um, social and political justice-oriented values. And I think that the, the, the thing that's so critical about movement and embodiment and dance is that it's, there's another, it's just a different form of communication and knowledge sharing that I think is such an important piece of this larger framework of culture shift that the world really needs and, and you know, f stakeholders and all of us have a responsibility to, to usher in. So I think for this festival, and, and you know, of course, the history of the pillow is just so rich and dynamic in terms of how dance has been defined, who has been invited um, to, to the pillow historically. So really looking at the archives was such a rich point of departure um, to really think about, okay, like what are, what are the histories and the, and the narratives that um, the pillow has traditionally amplified? Where can we continue to do, that, to do that? Whose stories can we raise the volume on? How do we direct resources to those stories to be told and those culture bearers to be included um, in this larger institutional history? So I think that the time has always been now and having the, re the I think there's a suite of resources the interdisciplinary nature of the pillow. It's not only, I mean, in addition to being a festival, it's a, it's a archival institution, it's a school. So there's so many ways to tap into these conversations around value shift and justice oriented um, conversations that I think is, is just such a privilege of, of, of working at an institution like this. It's one of a kind in that sense. So I, I knew I was really excited to activate all of those facets of this institution to really think about that. What is our goal in change? In the movement, literally, and in an embodied sense. Thank you. As I, as I, <laughs> I took the company class, Valley Hispanico, this morning, so I'm like in the vibe, so, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so I'd love to hear about, um, for Ali and Melanie, your curatorial priorities um, coming into this season and, um, you know, and, and if you could uh, illustrate for us kind of how that came to being in, in some of the artists that you helped bring here. So Easter Woodland um, and, uh, and Archie Burnett, who's coming soon, I'm super excited about. Uh, Latasha Barnes, who's also coming up. Um, the ways that the, how you approached uh, your curatorial duties, how that manifests in the artists that you, that you included in the festival this year. Well, you know, I, I think it would be disingenuous to not acknowledge that curators have tastes, <laughs> right? They have um, interests, they have things that they are drawn to, they have artists they are drawn to. So I don't think it surprised anybody that I was like, well, you have to have jazz on the program. <laughs> oh, I don't think it surprised anybody, you know? Um, that's the kind of work that I do as an artist and a and choreographer and scholar outside of this institution. And so, um, but the bigger thing as far as like how that shows up here is that jazz is, you know, America's dance form, right? It's the, the form that could only have been birthed here by black people. And it's underrepresented in the history of the archives of Jacobs Pillow. And I know because I'm a scholar in residence and I've been digging through those archives, right? So, um, so, that would be an example of like, what are things that Melanie's interested in and how can, and how do those things show up at the pillow? I think conversely, or maybe not even conversely, but um, alternately, uh, uh, you know, discussions happen, we meet weekly, uh, and discussions happen about where, you know, we'd like to have more of this, or can we find someone who maybe does this, or who are the artists that you're interested in who are living in, in sort of this designation, and names get sort of tossed, tossed into a collective document, right? And we, and we keep looking at that, and, it, and, it, and it's this combination of uh, wanting to uh, highlight, platform, advocate for artists who maybe haven't been here in the past, or, um, uh, who are on par with artists who have been here, but for some reason they just haven't been here. Like there's a variety of different ways I can define that, right? Um, 
looking at like who are those collection of folks. There are um, artists that we've had relationships with over time, but maybe haven't been here for a while. Like there's so many different ways to to look at who they are individually in the schema, but then also we're building a collective presentation, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the festival overall gonna look at and how do these different artists fit into the relationship of what a full festival is? Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, in terms of uh, you know, a commitment to black and indigenous artists, artists of color, um, that's well represented in, in, um, in the collection of artists that we're presenting in all of the different areas. And, um, and certainly, you know, Ali and I bring those to the table, as does Pam, right? And so I don't have a prior relationship with Valley Hispanico, right? Contra Tiempo was already programmed, and so like there, there's a, so there's these very sort of, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think it's super overly neat to be like, Ali and Melanie came in and brought the black people, because it's just not accurate, right? <laughs> you know, the, that the, the lens on which we're looking at the field is complex. And with that comes a responsibility, one that I willingly embrace, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, you know, I brought Brotherhood Dance to the table and everyone was on board with it because everyone, you know what I'm saying? So it isn't just like, you know, like me trying to ram in some name, you know, like it's a discussion. It's a, it's a, I feel like I'm getting further and further away from my point right now. But, <laughs> no, it, you're, but it makes a lot yeah. of sense. No, yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. For sure. Uh, and Ali, maybe, maybe now uh, in talking about your curatorial uh, contributions, you can also expand on the idea of uh, curation as a public good and how that kind of went into the thinking. Yeah, absolutely. I think when I, when I say that, when I say that, and um, why it feels important to like have that, I guess, in my, in my bio, is it brings me back to, I think curatorial practice historically has been a very elitist um, practice that can very quickly run away from itself from like the rootedness and like human, not only human connection, but connection to all things, which I think especially at the pillow we are in relationship to the environment in such a, you know, in such a intimate way. Um, so I think considerations around how are humans and non-humans in relationship to one another, that's like, a, that's just a pillow. That is, a, that is such a key facet of the curatorial sort of ethics of, of being at the pillow. So when I say curatorial practice must serve the public good in the context of the pillow, it's like we don't want to produce or present anything that will do harm to anyone or anything. And I think just entering with that, that sort of value system, um, you know, I, I think the idea of safe space is, doesn't really exist, but I do think I'm interested in, in moving forward to like an ethics of care and commun communication and with a set of values that really um, is thinking and not even thinking about enacting equity because ultimately curation of course is, you know, like I said in I think in my opening when you asked about how I define curation is it's about distribution of resources um, very directly um, and being mindful of at least in my role, I, I don't, I'm not, you know, working on city council, but I, part of my responsibility is to distribute funds. Um, and how that is done, I think is very political and I take very, very seriously, um, and as a public service. So I think in, with regards to, you know, the Eastern Woodlands program and the project with, with Archie Burnett, I, I've been really thinking about the, um, you know, the, the, the history of this land on which many of us are our guests. Um, the, the, the history of, of theft, of, of land, of resources, of lives. And so as a curator who's invested in, in dance as a form of knowledge production, how can I use that sort of arsenal, those tools, to not fix, but heal that damage? Um, and I think dance does play such a powerful role in, in that work. So um, Archie, Archie is super invested in, um, and is a culture bearer of uh, New York City underground dance forms. 
the, the artists in the Eastern Woodland programs, all culture bearers of the, of the um, tribal nations from which they're from. So I think it's really important to platform these folks in this context because of course they are, they are already in the galaxy, in the stars for the communities that respect and love them and care about them and they need to be part of the pillow conversation, the pillow ecosystem to extend the nature metaphor <laughs> even further. So, so, so yeah, I, I, hope, I hope curatorial practice could do more goodness and less, and less toxic hierarchicalness, I guess. I don't think that's a word, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, um, if I can, I think, you know, Ali's touching on something that feels really important to me in terms of curation, so maybe this goes back to your first question for me, is that in the programming of all of these artists, it's not the individual performance or individual work yeah. that I'm invested in. It's about the relationship building and how it's gonna support their career over time and how and the relationship that they're building to this institution. And so um, for the artists who are coming here for the first time, it's my intent that it will not be the last time, right? Mm -hmm. For the artists, um, for the visibility of, of um, indigenous folks and, and, and black folks and Latin folks and um, as we, as we endeavor to be better with Asian folks and disabled folks, um, it's it's a this is like a long term goal, right? This is like this is this is it's not a, it's not exclusively about twenty one. Even if I didn't come back, right? Even if I just like the job disappeared, it's never just about Festival twenty one, right. right? It's about the tentacles that the work that we did for Festival twenty one will have beyond this mm -hmm. one year. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And, and for an 89-year-old uh, organization, like that tentacle building is what we do. <laughs> you know, we build, we, we invest in people who, who feel that this is their artistic home. And so the idea that we can widen that circle of to whom this is an artistic home is really exciting. And I just have one other reflection, um, and it goes back to Ali doing the Instagram live chat with Crybaby Cozy after her first virtual commission and to see her deep relationship with this artist and to understand that I have artists that I'm deeply passionate about and I've been passionate about them for 25, 30 years. And these two people have artists that they're passionate about and how exciting it is to feel that passion and be able to amplify that mm -hmm. in the context that we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, as Melody said, it is taste, yes. These, these two people have different tastes than two other people who might be sitting here. And I want that, we welcome that at Jacob's Pillow and, and sort of to see who will be revealed in that is, is really exciting to me. Absolutely. I'd love to expand a little bit more on the relationship between curator and artist because it's coming up a lot in terms of advocacy, mm -hmm. in terms of care, in terms of- Equity. Um, and equity and, uh, and how in the past and in some places still, it is a very top-down hierarchical relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what would it mean to reimagine that? Ooh. For me, I think that the sort of the, the, the hierarchical or sort of binary nature of presenter artists feels so disingenuous to what my experience is. I think it is important to begin by saying, and I think I've mentioned this, that as a presenter who works for an institution, there are access to resources that I do have to distribute. That being said, my relationship with an artist is completely also contingent on their interest in working with me mm. and vice versa. So I, so I always try to remind myself, you know, I always say like, stay humble to the game. It's like, I, you know, I can have all the resources I want, but there have been plenty of folks that have been like, okay, not this time for whatever reason. It might not be a good match, something might happen. So I, for me, I think it's so much more syncretic or, or porous in that way, or maybe that's just how I build, that's just how I build relationships. And I think um, for artists, you know, artists are curators, artists are producers. Like I, I, I don't feel precious at all. I think for some, when, when they say on Instagram, like, oh, I'm an Instagram curator, for some that that really bothers people. And for me, I'm like, <laughs> I want that term to be democratized because we all engage in curatorial type practices on a day to day. Mm -hmm. So I witness artists curate their own festivals, cur you know, you know, or produce their own shows, like the show will go on without us. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think that my work as a curator, I consider myself an artist. 
I think this work is deeply creative. Um, it, it requires, uh, a, you know, a, a kind of facility with time and space and, and um, other resources that I think is why I love this work. I, I, I'm committed to it as an artistic practice. So, you know, I, I, for me, it's important to acknowledge that artist and presenter both have things to bring to the table and we are mutually interdependent mm -hmm. on one another to do this thing. You know, and we both are, we're, we're artists, we're, cre we're, create we're creators, we're creatives um, that are entangled. So, yeah, that will be my answer to that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, I have two thoughts. One is the reason that I'm doing any of the things I'm doing that fall under arts is because I'm a fan first. And I think that, that informs how I how I engage with artists in general, is that I love art, I love dancers, I love dance making, I love dance history, and, um, and I also, as someone who is a maker, I'm aware of like the labor mm -hmm. involved in that, and so there's a reverence mm -hmm. uh, for that. The other thing I wanna say is, um, March of 2020 revealed a lot of things about our field. <laughs> and uh, a lot of things about the economics of our field. Uh, I can personally say that as someone who does a lot of freelance work, all of my work went away and I was laid off from my full-time job in the arts in a span of two weeks, yeah? So um, there are conversations happening from all sectors, from artists, from arts workers, presenters, having these, these dialogues, I think we're just really beginning to get into the, the mm -hmm. real thick of it. Um, but, uh, and coming, not in coming out of it, because I don't think coming, we came out of it, but, <laughs> and moving forward from what for me was, you know, a lot of uncertainty between March and July. Uh, as I stepped into this role, and as I stepped into all areas of my career post March 2020, I'm, I'm just in a place of, I can make this whatever I want it to be. I can do the job however I want to define the job. I don't have to do it the way somebody else might have done it. Mm -hmm. And for me, that means I can't go into it without a sense of um, ethics and responsibility towards the people that I'm working with, who, I, who, I, who have been through hell. <laughs> You know, who've watched their entire, you know, financial futures just disappear in the span of weeks. Um, had to return money. I, was in, I, had a, I had a gig where they asked me to return the money. Like, it's a lot of crazy things that were happening that I don't think people are really wow. aware of. That was, that was really, um, heartbreaking isn't the word, because uh, that makes it sound romantic. Traumatizing? It, yeah, that's a, that's a better choice, <laughs> right? And so... Um, the, I, as we conceive of what it means to do this work and to be responsible and ethical and to engage in a relationship that involves reciprocity with artists, that's the only thing I'm interested in doing. Mm -hmm. The only thing. And if I can't do it that way, then I don't want to do it. Um, and, and I think also um, for me, this is like a really specific thing for me, I think it's the privilege of age, of, ha of mm. feeling convicted at 48 in a way that maybe if I had been 38 or 28, I might have hedged my bets a little bit more. I might have felt like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm representing the institution. I have to, you know, and now I'm like, well, but the, you know, I'm also representing myself, and I have to have a, a, a real conviction in the, in the idea that the institution will only benefit if I do this ethically. Only good can come of that. But if I don't, like, they're, they're the opposite, the, the outcome of that, those, those tentacles again, Right? It can, be good, it can be for good or for bad, and I'm trying to use my powers for good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well said. Yeah, I, I just want to go back to this word of interdependency. We all realized our interdependency, that, that this whole notion of that there's, there's a power structure, of course, between the presenter who has the resources and the artist that needs the resources. The pandemic hits. We, we, in order to fulfill our mission, we need artists. We need artists here. And so the very first thing we brokered in conversation was what would it take for you to be able to have a residency here? What will, would it take in terms of safety, in terms of resources, um, in terms of testing? So 
you know, all of that thinking was uh, very reciprocal. We want you here, but what do you need to be able? There was no cookie cutter about it. There was this, you know, person who was based here, this person who was based there, um, all of that. And then leading up to this summer, which was, you're dealing with, with um, a field that has been decimated. Dance is the most underserved of all of the art forms in terms of philanthropic dollars. It's on a fragile thread to begin with. So when this happened, to, to have companies think about how, I mean, there, there was a, a, a choreographer who we had in a pillow lab who said, I wasn't sure I could create anymore. I wasn't sure after taking five months away that I still had it in me. And this is a brilliant, brilliant artist. And to sort of say, it's actually, we, we have to work to, together to have it be so that you you will have the confidence to come back to this work again because we need you in this field. But that's how, how uh, decimated uh, people were financially but also emotionally in, yeah. their, in their core. Yeah. So then when it came to the summer, um, what are the conditions? Like, are you, are you going to be, do you think you'll be ready to present something this summer? If you know, you've been in isolation, what will it take? So that's something, and, and I will say that in addition to the artistic curation, we, we talk through finances, we talk through number of days. So what we made a decision was anyone who needed a residency week before their performance here to get their companies back up and running, we committed to that, that week. And we built a whole tent, which is the one if you drive down George Carter Road, the one uh, on the left, uh, I'm sorry, on the right if you're driving down just past the Henry Jailer stage, that's the residency tent. So the ability to, uh, to that, that's, that's not something we ever do. We're a festival. We're, we pride ourselves in being able to turn things over in a day. You know, oh no, not this year. We, we cannot have the privilege of having artists here unless artists are up and running and able to do that. And, and I just have to give a shout out to the entire staff yeah. of Jacob's Pillow who thought through complex sequencing of schedules, arrivals, quarantine time, you know, uh, cohorts, like, oh my gosh. But that was because we, we were in it together with these artists. It, it, it's not, a, a, it's, it's, it's only with that reciprocity being true and deep and supported that, that this festival could happen at all. And it's my hope that all of the things that the field's doing right now to just to get us up and running, that we learn from those things and we take them forward with us. And we don't just behave like, oh, well, that was the gap, you know, the stop gap, so mm -hmm. we could get back to doing what we already, what we normally do. We don't have to actually go back to that version. We can, it's a, everything's a choice. You could just choose not to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I want to open it up for questions from you all. Um, yes. Uh, so a question about, uh, balancing the consideration of the, the income from sales and, and how you, um, you know, think about uh, bringing in an audience and, and whether that, whether and how that factors into curatorial decisions. I mean, sure, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, you know, like revenue's important. Um, and sort of the, the I think I'm gonna let Pam talk about businessy things because uh, <laughs> I get to live in a space where I just get to imagine and <laughs> throw out names. But uh, but um, you know, facetiousness aside, um, I think in considering also like what is the revenue and who are the pillow audiences, we're also you know. The, Ali mentioned safe space. I'd say, but we're trying to actually operate in a, in a brave space. Yeah. Which is yeah, that. I believe in safe space. Yeah, yeah, same. <laughs> um, which is that um, as we enact change, we also have to be brave about the way that we do it and help guide our audiences to go on that journey with us. And I think if we only thought about the bottom line and about revenue and about, you know, fan favorites and things like that, then nothing would change. And so um, if you're going to commit to, the, to the, the true social justice work that involves equity and representation and visibility and change, um, that means going about it in ways that you hadn't done it before. And that does mean um, that it intersects with the finances in a way that it hadn't before either. And so um, I don't work in that area of the institution, but I suspect that there's some kind of learning curve that, you know, um, that an education that's happening with that yeah. as well in terms of how it works and with budgeting and how it works with development and all of those things. Like 
the curatorial team isn't the only one that's engaging in this. The entire institution is doing this work, right? Mm -hmm. And so the programming that we do affects all of the things all of the things. It affects the food that we're serving, it affects the parking, it affects the work Ina does, into, like, like, like all of it gets affected. Um, and so uh, I think I'm probably being vague about in the ways in which it does that because there's certain things I can't really talk about. But, um, but I, think, I think the bravery is important. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I think, I mean, I think that the Henry J. Lear stage is such a perfect example of how we've had to adapt you know, in for, for tragic circumstances and also, you know, I guess it's all it's all been tragic and complicated <laughs> circumstances. Um, that that having the privilege of having an outdoor such a beautiful campus, um, and an outdoor stage has I think opened for us curatorially to think about well what venues on the campus have served certain kinds of companies or audiences? Like how explicit has that been spoken about? What's the relationship between companies that are a big draw in revenue? How can we use this summer to kind of break that apart? And we had the, we've had the opportunity to do that because Inside Out, I, I've just been looking at the Inside Out, um, uh, 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 what is that, plaque um, the, in this talk and just thinking about how this summer has really been such an incredible opportunity to think critically around how spaces are valued on campus, how that's connected to revenue, what are we saying implicitly or explicitly about that, and how can we really utilize, I mean, some of the performances here, the stage is everywhere, and audiences are, you know, in such, you know, grouped together in these experimental ways that I think really are, building audiences, I think you have to take the risk of having a smaller audience or doing things differently to provide the experience for the for publics to then be able to continue to do and continue to experiment and having the pillow community sort of come on that ride. But I think this has been the extension of grace and experimentation that I think we've been on and that audiences seems to really respond to, I think, there will be a lot of learnings mm -hmm. from from what that means in terms of like the bottom line for festivals um, to come. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I think that's true, and I think, you know, I came here in 2016, and this organization is so well run, and Ella Baff, my predecessor, had done so much to build audiences and and make this such a happening place. So of course, I wanted to keep this thing going because it, it was, people were so engaged with it. And there was a certain, you know, there's there's work that gets presented in the Sean, works that were presented in the Duke and works that were presented on the Henry Jadler stage in the Inside Out series. So in many ways I sustained that with with some variation. And then all of a sudden this happens and now we have an opportunity to really sort of stop the way things have been done and rethink them. Mm -hmm. And so this summer, for example, on the Henry J. Lear stage are two companies, Contratiempo and Brian Brooks, that would have been in the Doris Duke, Bally Hispanico that would have been on the Sean. They may never have thought of themselves on an outdoor performance space. And so what does that tell us about how we can think much more broadly and creatively about sites, about the hierarchy of our spaces, and about the new places that we've revealed. I mean, I, I just have to say, we open with Doran Stance's uh, roving performance, uh, Ways to Now, where she used six different locations on campus. I mean, it, it was so exciting. There will now be robust site-based work at Jacob's Pillow because we've experienced its potential this summer. The weekend performances this summer, uh, we know just architecturally, we have nine Henry J. Lear companies, one each week, and every week in a different site activation. And in terms of hierarchy, you have everyone from Okwi Opokwasili, who's MacArthur Genius Award winner, doing a site-based work by our pond, and New England Soul Line Dance, because it's a participatory forum, and as I think it was Melanie or Ali who said, you know, what better forum to do when you have to social distance than soul line dancing? So, you know, the fact that there is a, a, a breadth and a sense of experimentation, we're gonna learn a lot this summer from, from what audiences um, take to, 
um, and, and how it feels to present in the different spaces. Thank you. Um, we've come to the end of our time. I think that's a great note to end on, experimentation, this discovery. Um, thank you all for being here with us today to, to share this insights, to take us inside the process. And thank you for curating such an exciting uh, festival this summer. So, Ali, Melanie, and Pam, thank, thank you so much. Thanks. This is fun. This is really fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.